Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about preventing garden disease, and we'd like to thank Antoinette Fur for liking and sharing the podcast. In ancient Rome, small stone statues were placed in gardens to protect the plants from disease and pests. Hmm. And gnomes were thought to be a creature that would protect the treasures of the earth and protect your garden at night. Hmm. So in Germany in the 1800s, they started making these gnomes for gardens, and they had a long white beard, a red hat, and very simple clothing. Hmm. In the 1930s, after Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, gnomes became popular in the U.S. (laughs) And then in the 1990s, the traveling gnomes became popular. So you would go into somebody's garden, you'd steal their gnome, and then you'd travel around the country with it, taking pictures of where you were, and send these pictures to the person, and then you'd sneak it back into their garden after your road trip. So you're borrowing it, not stealing it. All right, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) There are hundreds of different bacteria, fungal, and viral diseases that can attack the plants in your garden. We're not going to talk about all of them today, One by one. (laughs) So having a good routine for setting up your garden each spring and then a fall cleanup plan is going to help prevent many of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And you want to start with the soil health. So if you're just starting a new garden and you're doing it in ground, you want to mix in three or four inches of organic material and you want to till this down to about six inches. So you're mixing all this together. And you can rent a tiller at a rental store or a home center You'd want to add compost or mushroom compost, leaf mold, or peat moss together, and this is going to improve the soil structure. It's going to increase the microorganisms. If you have sandy soil, it's going to help hold water and nutrients, Mm -hmm. and if you have clay soil, it's going to make it more porous, allowing air and nutrients and water to move through the soil easier. Mm -hmm. And there's been a few university studies recommending using a variety of compost from different companies over a period of years. Hmm. and you actually get healthier plants. Interesting. The University of Nebraska says that vermicompost is one of the healthiest composts you can use in your garden. What is that? And this is where they're using worms to break down and mix the compost, plus it adds their waste to it, so very very good fertilizer in there, plus it improves the soil structure. So this is something you buy? Yes. Or something you create? Yes, either. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's good stuff. Well, yeah, you can make it yourself. You can add red worms to a compost, and and now oh, you have now you have vermi compost, or you could just or, buy it. Right. So the first year, if you're creating a garden in ground, you would want to till in all this organic material. But after the first year, you don't have to till again. Hmm. So you're just going to add a couple of inches of new compost on top. And it's slowly going to break down to the soil. It's going to improve the soil structure. It's going to feed the microbes and worms. If you're going to be using a raised bed for your garden, you'd want some type of potting soil rather than a top soil or a garden soil. It's too heavy. So the, the garden most, soil's too heavy? Some of the garden soils are it's very... too heavy for your garden? Right, right. Yeah, you wouldn't want to use a garden soil in your garden. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the top rated mixes is using one-third compost, one-third peat moss, and one-third either vermiculite or perlite. Does it matter? as far as a vermiculite well vermiculite is interesting so this is a mineral that they heat up and it kind of expands and so this aerates the the soil very well and also retains water very well perlite is volcanic glass that they treat it heats it up and it kind of explodes too and this holds moisture but it aerates the soil better than vermiculite vermiculite is going to hold more moisture so depending on what your your plants need or what your soil needs so in this mix, you know, either one will probably do a good job. A lot of the gardeners that I read, they seem to like the perlite more. So the answer is yes. It, it is. matters. Well, I forget what the question was. <laughs> well, if you're if you're adding this as a soil amendment to an in-ground garden, right? Then what does your, what do your plants need? So if they need more moisture held by the roots, then you'd use vermiculite. If you've got, let's say, a, a clay soil, then you would probably use perlite because it aerates better. So again, yes. Yes. <laughs> the more beneficial microbes you have in your soil, the healthier your plants are going to be. And they're breaking down the nutrients in the soil so they can be absorbed easily by the plants. Mm-hmm. If you're using an organic fertilizer, it's going to actually add more organic material to the soil. It's going to feed the microorganisms. It helps fight disease. 
it slowly breaks down to give an even feeding to your plants and it improves the quality of the soil mm -hmm. where synthetic fertilizers don't improve the soil they don't benefit the microorganisms and some studies are saying that overuse can kill the microorganisms in the soil so you want to get fertilizers that are recommended for vegetables because some fertilizers have too high of a nitrogen count right. and aren't good for many plants. Hmm. Some studies done by Clemson University showed that seaweed fertilizer is beneficial to many garden plants. Hmm. And in ancient Rome, they used seaweed for mulch and for a fertilizer in gardens. Hmm. And seaweed fertilizers are used by the English and Scottish football stadiums and golf courses. They say it's good for the soil health mm -hmm. and it increases resistance to stress and disease. Mm. Some top rated seaweed fertilizers, Espoma, has their organic traditions kelp meal. Do you know how to spell that? E S P O M A. <laughs> Grow More is the name of the brand, it has their seaweed extract. And Kellogg Garden Organics has a fish kelp liquid. Mm. When you're feeding your plants, you want to follow the recommended feeding schedule. Too much can affect the plant health and also increase stress. A couple of the top-rated organic fertilizers, Neptune's Harvest is an all-natural organic, and Wiggle Worm Soil Builder by Unco, it's U-N-C-O, and this is earthworm casting, so it's high in beneficial bacteria and microbes, rich in nutrients that's easily absorbed by the plants, and it actually improves the soil structure. Hmm. So it's pretty interesting. And then you can always add worms to your garden. Besides having excellent waste, they aerate the soil. They come to the surface. They pull down organic material into the soil. They break it down. And you can buy worm eggs. Why? So, that, <laughs> so you can add worms to your garden. <laughs> so there's a company called Rocky Mountain Worm Company. Mm -hmm. They sell African night crawler eggs for your garden. So That's you put gross. it into your garden, and it can hatch these worms that grow to four to eight inches long. <laughs> you want to keep compost or mulch on the soil surface to reduce evaporation, keep the soil temperature cooler, keep plant leaves from touching the soil, and prevent soil from splashing up on the leaves during a rain or while you're watering it. Hmm. Because many of these soil fungus diseases are spread by the spores getting onto the leaves. Really? Many of the pros are suggesting pruning the bottom leaves to avoid contact with soil or mulch. Hmm. And for most plants, you want to water the soil, not the leaves, because sprinkling the leaves can actually spread these spores hmm. from an infective leaf to one that's healthy or from one plant to another just from watering. So how are you supposed to avoid getting the leaves wet? Just either use soaker hoses or drip irrigation or you know water in trenches. So you want to water down low. Or use an olla. <laughs> oh, boy. So Fan Shang Chi Shu from about 100 BC recommends using unglazed clay pots buried in your garden. Is this a to, person? Right, yeah, Fan. <laughs> so I found a company, they're called Dripping Springs Oyas, and they have Oyas with gnome faces that you bury into your garden. So, <laughs> so you get an Oya and a gnome, wow. both in one. You bury this, and you just leave the neck out or you know the top of the Oya. Mm -hmm. It has a lid on it. So it reduces evaporation. The oyas, they slowly release water, so there's very little waste. And the roots are going to grow toward the oyas, reducing garden disease spread from watering. So and how you, many of these are you supposed to have? So they recommend a series of these pots about 18 inches from your plants. Hmm. And you're going to lay this out. And so you're just filling this a couple of times a week. You put the lid on, and it, does the, it slowly does the watering for you. Hmm. So it's just a very efficient way to water. And when you're watering, in general, you want one to two inches worth of water per week, but you want to check your plants for their water needs. Too little water is going to put stress on the plant, and it makes it more susceptible to disease. And you want to water one or two times a week, and one deep watering rather than more often and shallow watering. Clemson University recommended if you have sandy soil, water about two times a week. If you have clay soil, about one time a week. And one deep watering is going to stimulate deep root growth, and mm -hmm. you're going to have healthier plants. You want to keep your garden weed-free. Some weeds can spread disease, and mulch is going to help prevent weeds. Many weeds have developed to germinate in hot, dry soil, so that mulch is going to keep your soil temperatures cooler. It's going to help block sunlight. And by adding new mulch and compost to the garden each year and not tilling it, mm -hmm. you're going to keep those weed seeds buried and dormant. Another nice thing about mulch is crickets like mulch, and they love to eat weed seeds. 
And if you but count... But I don't like crickets. But they eat your weed seeds. Okay. And they can also tell you the temperature. So if you count how many chirps a male field cricket makes in 13 seconds and add 40 to it, you know the temperature. <laughs> You can put down an organic weed control like corn gluten meal in spring, and this is going to prevent weeds from germinating. It's also a slow-release fertilizer, but you don't want to use it if you're planting seeds. Hmm. So you're only using this if you're planting plants or seedlings. The way you want to use it, it make sure the package is marked for weed control because there's different formulas. You want to water it in with only a quarter inch of water. You want to get it into the soil, and that's so it touches the weed seeds. And then you need it to dry out for a couple of days, so no rain in the forecast. Hmm. And then use this before the soil temperatures reach 60 degrees Fahrenheit for about a week in a row. Preen also has a garden weed control. Preen is P-R-E-E-N, and this is a pre-emergent. It doesn't kill any existing weeds. Hmm. You want to keep the mulch in the area below the plants free of debris. You want to pick up any cut leaves and twigs because they can spread disease. So if you're cutting off diseased leaves, the spores on that can spread back to the healthy leaves. Really? So you want to remove all this from the garden. Mm -hmm. Spacing is also very important to help prevent disease. You want to keep the plants the recommended distance apart to increase air circulation. It's going to help keep the leaves dry. Mm -hmm. And the more space you have, it discourages fungal and mold growth and also increases production. Hmm. You want to stake your plants if needed to keep the leaves off the ground and allow airflow underneath it or prune the low branches. And when you're setting up your garden, create beds that are easy to work around so you can move carts or wheelbarrows. And you want to be able to reach in and maintain your plants easily. Right. Wind, watering, and bugs can spread disease, so aphids are a big problem for many gardens. Spores get on their bodies and then they carry them from leaf to leaf or they carry it to other plants. Hmm. So you can use an insecticidal soap you want to look for the OMRI certified symbol on the label, and that's the Organic Material Review Institute. Right. Some products like Safer Insect Killing Soap that can be used up to the day of harvest, huh. so that's how gentle they are. Garden Safe is another top-rated insect soap, and they're using fatty acid salts to kill these garden pests. Interesting. Neem oil is another garden pest killer, and it's N-E-E-M, and this stops insects from wanting to eat or reproduce, hmm. and it comes from a tree in South Asia. You spray this neem oil on your plants, it coats the bugs, larvae, and eggs, it kills them, and it's also absorbed by the plant, so it kills bugs when they feed on the leaves, which hmm. is pretty interesting. What's also wild is neem oil can be used to treat for root rot, black spot, sooty mold, rust, mildew, and scab. So just a very versatile oil. Hmm. You want to look for OMRI. It can be used up to the day of harvest. Interesting. You can also add good bugs to your garden. So you can buy ladybugs or lace wings to control aphids and other pests and buy those online and just put them into your garden. If you have a water element around you... Maybe put them in your garden. So you just get like ladybugs. You can buy ladybugs. Then at night you're going to spray down your leaves so they kind of stay there. You can use a, a sugary sugar water and spray okay. your leaves and then they want to stay there overnight. Where do they come in? A ladybug container. <laughs> and then at night you, you, you just put what, a, open it? Right, open it up and you shake it all on, on your, in your garden. And, and a certain, there's going to be a certain amount that are going to lay eggs. Uh -huh. And they're going... Then the, the larva just loves to eat aphids. So you can add this to your garden. You can also add frogs and toads if you have water elements, <laughs> and they're good at eating bugs. In 1200 BC, China figured out that they could use predatory ants to protect citrus groves from caterpillars and beetles, and they would tie strings and sticks from plant to plant so that the ants could easily go from plant to plant to go after these caterpillars and beetles. Mm, good to know. You should also rotate your crops. So by rotating the location of your plants each season, you're going to reduce disease and pests. You're going to increase the soil health. And each plant is drawing different nutrients out of the soil and at different rates. Right. And you should vary the same types of crops in an area also. So some pests will stay in a section of the garden over the winter, and they're looking for a specific type of plant. So moving the plants helps reduce the amount of pests. Hmm. And some fungal diseases linger in the soil for years. So by rotating your crops susceptible to those diseases, it also is going to reduce your problems. And most pros are saying you should have at least a three-year rotation plan of grouping your plants and moving them around. Interesting. 
One grouping is keep all the legumes together, so peas and beans. Another one is rooty plants, so onions, turnips, carrots, garlic, beets, and radish. Leafy plants, so lettuce, herbs, cabbage, and spinach. You want to keep those together. And then fruit, cucumber, tomato, squash, eggplant, pepper, and melons. Those would be four different sections of your garden, and you'd rotate those annually. A couple of university studies have shown that if you have sweet corn in an area and then you plant potatoes there the next year, that they do better than normal. Interesting. Tomatoes are taking more calcium out of the soil. Beans are taking manganese out of the soil. And one study showed that nitrogen from legumes stayed in the soil longer and was easier absorbed by plants than synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. Huh. When you're buying your plants, get disease-resistant plants and seeds. You can find out what your local diseases are and get seeds and plants that are resistant to that. And most of these are going to have really cool names. Like you can what? get super sugar snap peas, <laughs> salad bush cucumbers, red chief strawberries, Viva Italia tomatoes, and Iron Lady tomatoes. Wow. And if you're picking only disease-resistant plants, it's the easiest way to reduce the number of infections you're going to get. You're going to have less pests and you're going to minimize the need for pesticides and chemicals. Hmm. If you're a new gardener, buying plants rather than seeds is going to be much easier. You get the immediate reward of having a plant, right. and then you can really look at each plant, pick the best-looking ones. You want to avoid plants with any discolored leaves, drooping leaves, or any spots on them. Mm -hmm. For plants that get black spots, powdery mildew, curling leaves, fungal rust, yellowing spots or leaves, gray spots or white spots, <laughs> you want to remove the leaves or stems immediately with a pruner, and you don't want to leave any of those leaves or debris underneath the plants. You want to get those spores out of the garden, hmm. and you don't want to add this to a compost pile. Interesting. You should clean your tools after each plant or moving to different plants using either soapy water and scrubbing the blades or a solution of nine parts water and one part bleach, and that's going to sanitize your pruner. Hmm. If you have a whole plant that's full of disease, you want to pull it out and discard it before it affects the other plants, especially with tomatoes. Right. And powdery mildew is this fuzzy white growth, or it could be gray too, on the leaves, and it can be a wide range of fungi. Mm -hmm. And if you have leaves with this powdery mildew, you want to cut them off and then spray the plant to help prevent the spread of this. Right. And one of the most popular formulas is one gallon of water, one tablespoon of baking soda, one tablespoon of vegetable oil, and one tablespoon of dishwashing liquid. Hmm. You're going to mix that all and then spray your plants once a week in the morning. You don't want to, so you want it to dry out too. Right, so right. you want to always do this in the morning. Another treatment is one part milk, any kind of milk, and two parts water, and spray your plants every 10 days. And scientists still don't know exactly why this works, but it's very effective on some plants. That's weird. You want to apply this in bright sunlight to both sides of the leaves. Hmm. <laughs> One preventative that's highly rated is Serenade from Bear Advance. So it's S-E-R-E-N-A-D-E. -E -E. And this fights a wide range of fungal and bacterial diseases. And it uses bacteria to control the other bacteria <laughs> and disease. So it's pretty cool. And it's O-M-R-I rated. For black spots on roses, Cornell University suggests using one teaspoon of baking soda, one teaspoon of insecticidal soap, one teaspoon of horticultural oil, so like a neem oil, mm -hmm. and one quart of water, and you spray a layer of this onto the leaves once a week during the full growing season. Interesting. How do they figure this stuff out? Experimentation. <laughs> do you have anything else to add? When you're starting a garden, you want to think about the soil health. Add a couple of inches of compost or mulch every season. Use an organic fertilizer. Water the soil, not the leaves. Mm -hmm. You want to reduce the amount of weeds in your garden. And have really good spacing. You want air circulation. You can add some bugs. <laughs> think, think about neem oil. You want to rotate your crops and get disease-resistant plants and seeds. And then if any leaves look weird at all, prune them. Get rid of them. <laughs> And just to be safe, add a garden gnome. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, and iHeartRadio. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 deep
Jeff with the Jeff with the